Um, for all of you who know him, Josh, Josh uh, Lunger is one of our new leadership fellows this year. He's a first year leadership fellow, a senior political science major who currently uh, works over at the Chamber of Commerce uh, with Jordan downtown. Um, he's had, obviously, a little more life experience than a lot of us in this room. He had a very interesting life experience between high school and college, as he can tell us about here today. Uh, so, without further ado, Josh Lunger. You know, it's nice to see you. I don't know how many people I'm shaking hands with, but um, I'm really happy to have this opportunity. I've never shared my experiences um, with a group like this before. So, you know, I sat down with Brian and I decided, you know, which experiences would be the best to share with you guys. And I, I thought of a couple that um, I really learned a lesson from, and these kind of fit under the, the crisis period that uh, we were just talking about. Um, and that, you know, really put me in a hard position. So, I'm just going to try to make this as easy to understand as possible. Um, if at any time I spot out some acronym or something crazy and you don't understand because there's a lot of jargon, um, just raise your hand um, or just chime up and we'll talk about it. And same thing with, you know, this nice small group. If, if I make a point and you have a comment or a question about it, please just just let me know, it'd be great to have a discussion more than just a presentation. Um, but a brief background, uh, when I was 17, I uh, decided I wanted to be a paratrooper. I don't know, probably watched too much Band of Brothers. <laughs> but, um, um, I was definitely afraid of heights. So that was fun. Um, you can see how happy I am, rigged up right there, <laughs> ready to go. But, um, no, but you know, it's a, it was a great experience. Uh, so I joined in my senior high school when I was 17 and shipped out um, that summer uh, after just turning 18. I spent uh, five months in Kentucky uh, for basic training. I signed as a as a 19 Delta Cavalry Scout, so it's kind of like um, it's a combat MOS, a combat profession where uh, you kind of operate in smaller groups. And you know, uh, in the past, they kind of go and oh, here's the enemy, let's hit with artillery. So. Um, Another thing that got me excited was, you know, the danger, oh, you're going to be out by yourself and you know, all sorts of enemies. So I uh, did that, and then shortly after basic training, I went to airborne school where I began my days of jumping out of airplanes. And then following that, I got out in December 08. I decided that I wasn't quite ready to be completely done, so I joined the Michigan Army National Guard and served two years and finished up last year. So I deployed to Iraq. In November 2006, and it was originally supposed to be a 15 month or a four month appointment, excuse me. Um, unfortunately, uh, the rotation that was supposed to be set up uh, was kind of chopped because of um, the surge. I don't know if you guys remember the surge, the big let's center everybody to Iraq. So, everyone that was supposed to relieve us was then deployed in the surge, so we spent a little extra time there. Um, so, I'm trying, I just want to frame kind of our basic life conditions and how that worked. Um, but, I mean, you can see there, there's kind of our outfit. Um, so, I was fortunate in that our troop, along with two infantry companies from the 2nd Brigade Combat Team of the 8th Airborne Division, um, were selected to deploy in a kind of special manner. We operated under a task force commanded by General Crystal, which was a special force task force. So I got to work in some pretty interesting environments with some pretty interesting people. Um, some guys that I don't even know what kind of special force group they belong to because I can't tell you. So I, I got to see a lot, of, a lot of cool things. It was a lot of hard work because all of our missions were air assault, which means we would go in on usually two flights of either Chinooks or Blackhawks. And uh, our missions ranged from uh, like a quick response to maybe, uh, what's a good example? Uh, a facility was rated that was used for water purification and the, some chemicals were stolen to make bombs. So we would quickly respond and go and you know, try to find those chemicals before they could be used. Or it'd be intelligence gathering or special forces doing this and need support. Or this is a high value target you have to go and find. So we'd land in their backyard and see if they're home. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it was great. Like, I am really fortunate in that my experience was so uh, fast paced. I mean, of course, there's a lot of days where you're just sitting around. But I felt like I got to do something special where I made an impact. I mean, we were told that we defeated this many organizations of Al Qaeda, whatever group, 
and uh, we're the only uh, unit to ever receive Delta Force's colors, which are hanging probably in our, C in our troop CP still down in Fort Bragg, uh, which I guess is the highest honor. We're the only non Special Forces unit to ever receive their colors. And it came with a plaque and everything. Um, so the good news is, though, at, in between air assault missions, which were usually four days long, give or take, um, we would go, we had a, our own little private compound on a major base. So I had some of the comforts. We lived in a tent, uh, I think it was about 12 people. But we also had, you know, a chow hall, a PX, phones that we could use, internet connection was a hit and miss. Um, and eventually we got like Armed Forces Network TV. And so in between being out in the field, um, walking around for ridiculous distances, uh, things weren't too bad. So the first point I want to comment is about seven months in, I was given the opportunity to take a leadership position. And um, I still remember it because I was sleeping. Uh, we were on reverse cycle, so um, that means that you sleep during the day usually and get up at night that way because we only insert for aerosol missions at night. Um, and my platoon sergeant walked in and I was sound asleep, it was probably about noon, and he kicked my, my uh, cot as hard as he could and woke up. And I didn't even, couldn't even see him because I didn't have my glasses on. And I told him, and he goes, Lunger, you want to be a leader still? And I remember saying, like, yes. He's like, my tent right now. And I just like threw everything off and tried to find my notebook because I don't need the notebook somehow and, and ran in there half dressed. And from then on, I, I had to deal with some challenges. Um, here's just some pictures. Here's our platoon. We got, it's about 16 scouts in a platoon, the smaller group than the infantry company. And then there's the whole troop, which is uh, three platoons and then a headquarters platoon. So 16, probably about 80 to 90 sometimes, if people come and go. Um, but I immediately faced a real challenge um, in that I was taking a position of my friends and my peers, you know, my former peers. And um, I, I mean, you, please was talking about how when you're leading a team, kind of focus on those four things, mission, vision, values, and tasks. Well, I was kind of absorbed in the fact that I felt like I had something to prove because I was younger than all my guys, all, all but one. I was only uh, just turning 20, and I was the same rank as them. I mean, I took the position, but and I went to the board to get promoted, but you have to make points in the military. Um, there's a process for at a certain point you make points. So I was the same rank. I was younger, I, I felt like I had something to prove and that they wouldn't respect me unless I proved it. So um, it also didn't help that the leader that I had for a long time directly above me, not above them, I had some good leaders, I had good and bad, but the leader directly above me was a, a world-class terror, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> this, I, I mean, to be blunt, I mean, a lot of guys just couldn't take him anymore, like they just, it pushed people to the edge in the environment that we were already on edge. Um, and some days it just felt like, why is he making life so miserable for us when it doesn't need to be? And that was the leadership that I had to follow, even though I had some abilities above it that were almost oblivious to it, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, because everyone's so busy. But the thing is that kind of, I kind of started becoming that person and an attempt to you know, garner that respect and trust that I wanted so bad. You know, what, if, like we've said sometimes, it's, it was more about me and it shouldn't have been. You know, I, I was always looking over after my guys. Everything on a mission was set, but I was being hard line when I didn't need to be hard line. And I just, I, just, I think that one of the lessons that I want to get out of the way right now on this is that sometimes even if you have a leader you don't like, that you start to take those qualities, or I don't even call them qualities, those, um, those traits almost. And that's that's your example. I mean, we're talking about voices in your head. His voice was in my head, you know, yelling at me. So <laughs> um, you take those traits. So you got to be careful to to take the traits that are good. Because he was, you know, this guy wasn't bad at his job as a as a soldier. He was world heavy. He's special forces right now. He he passed everything when I was still in the military. Um, he was great at that. But as a leader, and as you know, someone that's looking after soldiers in such a tough environment that need need guidance, they need a mentor. Um, he wasn't that person, and I started to become not that person. So, um, that's me with the big radio right there. Uh, 
I had a friend who was our medic, who um, was my work kind of my workout buddy in Iraq. We had a nice, decent gym, and uh, Fox Biker. And um, I was kind of talking about we were getting. I was a month or two into being a leader, and he kind of was talking to me at the gym, saying, "Hey, um, I was talking to Phillips, you know, a friend of mine today, and he doesn't even want to see you when you get back, you know." It, and I was completely unaware about where I was going, what line I was going down. Um, I think some of the qualities that led me to that position, I was leaving behind in exchange for some of the traits that I absorbed from the guy above me. And Doc just basically gave me that gut check that um, was just talking about. He was the guy that I needed to listen to. And we talked about it for that whole time at the gym, and I went back and I lost some sleep that night. And the next day, a task came up that uh, it's a Conix, I don't know if you know what a Conix is, it's a giant thing full of gear and stuff. We need to get something out of it. So I volunteered. I immediately said, hey, I'll do it, I'll get my guys. And I took my guys out, the three guys that are on my breach team. I had about, on mission I had about 13 people underneath me, I probably should have clarified this, but um, I was mostly focused on a breach team, which was three guys and me. Um, and then other guys were part of ISO, so the section sergeant um, that replaced the guy that was the bad leader. Um, he was in control of the isolation team and I did breach, so we cleared the building. So I took those three guys out to the contest with me and they were clearing, they were clearing stuff out and they were kind of grumbling because they didn't want to be woken up that early with like noon again. And, but they do it, you know, and soldiers always grumble, but they do their job. So they um, were cleaning stuff out and I said, hey guys, can you stop a second? And I said, I think I made a mistake. And we talked for probably a good half hour about different circumstances that had come up for the last couple of months. You know, who I wanted to be, how much I wanted their, their you know, acceptance as their leader. Because, you know, in the back of my mind, I was, I was thinking that half of them probably thought, out of the whole group, how I thought that, why not me, why longer? Why did he get that opportunity? Um, and I was like, I was thinking too much about me and just not about doing my job. And uh, that was probably one of the best conversations I ever had the most. I felt like a weight was immediately lifted off my shoulders and that um, I didn't have that worry for. I think I realized at the time that, um, first of all, like we said, communication, I mean, I could have just asked them any time, but I just thought I knew that how they were feeling, but they weren't talking to me, and I didn't go out, see, out of my way to find out. Communication is so important, especially as a, as a leader of a smaller team. Um, from that on out, I took pride in the fact that if I knew something that could be told to my soldiers, I would tell them. I give them every little bit of information I have because when, when you're sitting there in a tent by yourself and you're like, why, why did I just find out about this? That's the wrong answer. Your leadership came to you beforehand and talked to you about it. I mean, there's no reason I should immediately just be a, a route for information to them because they're doing the job too. Um, but I think the biggest, the biggest takeaway I have from this is that um, I was in that position for a reason. I was selected for a reason that couple leaders that I very had a lot of respect for um, selected me, so they saw something in me. And I didn't stop worrying about them being so desperate for earning this respect when all I had to do was do my job. Um, stay focused on, like we've said, the mission, the vision, values, and tasks. So I just stay focused on that. And that's pretty much what they told me. I mean, it wasn't so nicely put, but they told me, you know, we, we know you're good at your job. We appreciate this. It's just the other stuff that you don't need to be doing. And it was like a slap in the face that I had fallen that far. Because I had, you know, I had no idea. But if I had just stay focused and do, do my job, that respect's gonna come if it's gonna come. And if it's not, oh well, like we have said also, you can't control what people think about you. You can't force them to like you and, and, and respect you and, and give you that, whatever you need. You just had to focus on doing your job. And from then on out, there wasn't any problems like that. Things went smooth, they were all my friends later on. Um, and we had the, just that pressure that needs to be there was lifted. And you don't need distractions when you're dealing with these type of situations in the first place. All right, well the next thing I want to talk about is uh, making some tough decisions. Um, and I'm gonna try to frame a situation for you, a mission that was unique in that uh, it's difficulties for me. Um, the reason I put, well, I'll skip to it. Basically, it was a five-day mission we were on. 
and we were very close to a friendly base, so it was supposed to be pretty quiet. And it turned out to be that in this single mission, we had more troops in contact, we call it tick, or basically you're shooting at the enemy, they're shooting at you. In this area, in our task force, and in any other mission, almost five other missions combined, it was it was a complete disaster. We found, I mean, we had like six pages of things um, handed out to us after the mission of items that we found that were used to, um, like, you know, weapons, radios, <coughs> anything. It was six pages long, RPGs, that we discovered, and we're three miles outside of a major uh, operating base in Iraq, so it was pretty surprising. And um, on about the fourth day, we had a situation where um, some type of overhead support had pictures of uh, guys with masks, which is usually a bad sign, and they wearing a mask. Um, and they keep driving on these crossroads, which were about, I'd say, three kilometers, if I remember correctly, uh, southeast of where we were stayed at, at that position. And so our section decided that we're gonna move there in the nighttime to a building in that corner and wait for these guys to come across and ambush these trucks with the guys with masks, and they had not a weapon on these trucks too. Um, so we moved, moved that night, we took a building that had some excellent cover where we could watch the road without being seen. Uh, I think there was about eight or nine of us, probably, um, plus a medic or an F-level port observer. Um, and nothing really happened in the morning, we were still watching when first platoon, which was 800 meters, west of us uh, got ambushed and they had a casualty who got shot in the face. Um, and they were pinned down and we were getting scrambled. So we threw our stuff on and we were told that we had to secure an LZ for a medevac, a landing zone for a medical evacuation helicopter. Um, that was my best attempt uh, to not throw out acronyms. But so we moved 800 meters, we ran just in time to get and secure a south side of an LZ for a, uh, a amazing helicopter pilot that somehow landed in this little crossroad because there's a lot of woods. This was a, um, more of, less of a desert area, more of a palm trees type thing. And we got the guy in the bird and he's actually fine today as far as I know. I saw him again a, few, like a couple years later. Um, so that was good. But we immediately started taking um, a building further up the street where they were ambushed so that first platoon could clear some palm groves while we overwatched because we had, they had to find these guys that were the ambush them. And so we put guys on the roof, a couple guys dropped their bags and just took a rest. We were tired, it was a long run, 800 nanometers in full kit with a rucksack is, is, is quite a trial. And um, so I took three or four guys and we were out front and we were searching tr uh, trucks as they came by, little Bongo trucks because Obviously, they could just throw stuff in the truck and just driven, try to drive right by us. So we're searching trucks, and somebody keeps popping his head out about you know 500 meters down. There's a ways down; you can barely see him. Keeps popping his head out at us, looking around the corner like, hey, "What are they doing?" So you know we've just got contact, so we're a little on edge. So we gave him a warning shot, you know, five, five, ten feet off of him. Probably that distance is probably a ways off. And you know, just get back. Don't don't sit there and peek at us because it was. That's, they're probably doing something bad. No one peeks around the corner unless they got something in mind. <laughs> and, uh, so, whatever. So, Hardy, my, uh, my point man, uh, shot down there, kind of disappeared for a second. Comes back, you know, a minute later, we're still clearing out these trucks. And he looks even more suspicious now. So, we shoot him again. And he keeps peeking his head around. Doesn't seem to matter what you do. So, I tell the LT on the radio, and he's like, well, go get him. And Hardy here said, he goes, why don't we just shoot him? I was like, you can't shoot him. We can't shoot him. And I was like, sir, we can't go get him. That's a stupid idea, basically, I told him. I don't know what I said, but I was like, I'm not going down there. <laughs> so he's like, no, I want him. I want to talk to him. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to talk to LT. You guys keep clearing these trucks. So I go into the building, and LT's like, go get him. And I'm like, you want me to go down there? It's like, one on one, who one on one? Someone's trying to worry you somewhere, you don't go down the road. This is a road with, um, here, this is the reason I put this in here. This is a, a canal. A lot of roads in Iraq, they have road on each side and the canal. Um, this is kind of a messy one. Usually it was, pretty, it was pretty straight in this existence. So there was a road, canal on the center, road on the other side, and there's not very many crossing points. And you really can't swim across while you're here on. So if you're on one side of the road, you're pretty much stuck there. Um, a lot of the guys on the same side of the road as us, but we were out there clearing it. 
And I go into the LT, and he's like, go get him, go get him. I'm like, I don't want to go get him. I don't want to go down there. It doesn't feel right. He's like, go get him. I was like, I would just shoot him. You know, I looked over my shoulder to make sure nobody could hear me saying it because I didn't want Hardy to know I stole his idea. But <laughs> um, I don't know if he ever knew that. I recommended that afterwards. I was like, oh, we can't shoot him. And then I go in there, oh, well, let's shoot him. And uh, so anyways, you know, I'm still an E4. I didn't have one point yet. I'm still waiting on points. So I really can't argue with LT, especially that LT. But, so we went, there was me and five guys. I had uh, an engineer um, and a trucker that we took out with us, a mechanic actually, who was an extra body, because we're so small that a lot of times at night we need extra people so we can get a couple hours extra sleep. Um, um, who I both outranked me, but since I was this guy, I was in charge. So I just, all along, I just felt wrong about this whole thing. And so I, I had everybody spread out Perfect. We were in a staggered column, which means you alternate first guy, second guy, third guy. We were spread out actually five meters, probably ten meters in, in between each group. And we're moving down this road. And we're, you know, with, with six people, and when people are getting hit all over the place, I don't think it's a good idea to go down a road 500, 600 meters, whatever it was, from where we saw this guy. That's obviously up to no good. So I'm sitting there, and I'm just thinking, of every little situation, I put myself in the back of the radio, and I'm just sitting there talking back and forth. And we're getting down to, we passed these crossroads that had some barriers. And I remember thinking, well, this is a good spot. And then we kept walking. And I put, my reasoning was not taking point myself because I had the radio. So I usually have only one hand on my weapon if, if nothing's going on um, to talk. So I put, you know, my point man up front because he was the guy that saw this guy. I never even knew where he was at and the engineer next to him almost, so that they can look for IEDs. They were almost parallel, the two of them. Everybody else was staggered because that way if an explosion goes off somewhere, you're minimizing your casualties. And I mean, I had thought of everything. I had the grenade launcher guy where I wanted them, I had um, everybody, everybody was positioned exactly how I wanted them for the best possible um, results. So we kept walking and we get near a mosque and I always get a bad feeling near a mosque because of the amount of lines of explosives I've tracked to mosques because we're not supposed to enter them. We had a little bit better um, rules in our task force so we could enter them. Um, but I still felt bad. And I remember saying, like, just like in a movie, it's like, guys, something doesn't feel right. I told them this, I go, guys, keep your eyes open because this doesn't feel good. And I take about two more steps and all of a sudden, like, the next, Two seconds, probably the longest two seconds of my life, because the front of the column, all I could see was um, smoke, and the point man got thrown. I could see a shadow get thrown, and then he disappeared in the explosion. Um, the engineer was like on his knees in a different direction, and I felt like someone kicked me in the chest because I don't know if anybody's ever felt explosions or anything like that. It's like a concussion. It just, it's like someone hits you all over at the same time. And this was a big explosion, and I remember. That you know, usually when something happens, we get shot at, or um, some you know, anytime someone's trying to kill me, I usually don't get scared, I just get mad. <laughs> I get really mad, and sometimes I yell, and you know, because they run, they shoot and run, and I didn't stand and fight me like a man, but um, I think that was the only time in Iraq I was really scared because the only thing that went through my head at that point in time was I just got killed. Wow. Because I thought there's no way it needs to that explosion, that thing was huge. And uh, I, was, I was scared for a second. And I, all these things were running through my head. It was amazing how many things I can remember running through my head. But the one that's the most clear was, I was for some reason I was thinking that he had a neck wound. And I was trying to remember different ways to stop bleeding from the neck. And I was also trying to remember where he keeps his med patch, which is in the back right. Um, and I was trying to remember, hopefully, I was trying to hope that his tourniquet was in the, the bottom of it so I could just grab it and put it around his arm or leg, whatever was severed. Because I was thinking worst case scenario. And, the dust started clearing, and I guess I got on the radio and I shouted, contact Southwest out, contact IED Southwest out, um, which is just a, a quick report saying, hey, we got hit by something. And I don't remember how I remember it was Southwest. Somehow I, I remember that the route actually turned Southwest to just walk or something, maybe repetitive looking at the map. But uh, I yelled it so loud, apparently, that uh, my section sergeant back at the, at the um, the building hundreds of meters away, didn't have his radio on and heard it. He actually had his radio down in a different room. He was, he was looking through some other stuff. He heard me shouting, and I, 
I don't even know how that's possible because I'm shot in their direction too. But um, so you know, it, it but the, like as the dust was kind of pushing away, um, I saw the point man was down on his knees and his IVA is uh, mask was ripped open because the explosion just, it blew him back. He was about five feet, five five six feet behind where he was at before, and he didn't know where he was. His helmet was lopsided. Um, he had just absolute blank stare going on. And I was yelling to the people go back to the class cross. I didn't like, I was telling Brian, I didn't remember when I yelled at people. They had to tell me later what I was yelling. Because all I was thinking is we gotta get out of here. So I was telling the guys to get back to the last crossroads. Um, there's a, uh, the barriers that I had noticed. I said, get back there right now. And you know, you here, you there. And I don't remember how much I yelled, but they said I had everything set up. And I ran up and I grabbed the point in by the back of his vest. And I yanked him up, he was trying to get up. And um, I yelled, run. And he looked at me like, he couldn't hear for anything probably, because he, he just looked at me like, what's going on? And I just shoved him. And I was like, okay, this is it. We're gonna get, someone's gonna pop up with an RPD or you know, AK or something right now, and just kill all of us. Because we are just, we're just, we don't know what's going on. Every, like that front two guys, the engineer was shaking up. He didn't know what's going on either. And the rest of us are, are running for our lives because we're not, like I said, there's a canal on this side. There was also another little bit of canal on the other side. And there was a bridge, like, you know, 50 meters ahead, but we're not gonna run to that forward. We're running backwards, because we had just come from that direction of a safe. Um, so, we, uh, yeah, I just thought we were done. I thought I was done. And I was running backwards for like 100 meters. I ran backwards, it was probably the fastest I ever run. Um, and we got back to this crossroads and sat the guys down against the wall and had everybody up in the 360 watching. Um, and I remember I'm feeling I'm feeling the point guy down because I'm thinking it's got to be some shrapnel with an explosion that big. And he had no no wounds. He had concussion and some flash burns on his face, but no wounds. And the same thing for the, the engineer. And later on, we we're thinking that either this guy because it was homemade explosives. We found another IED further down actually because the guy ran after afterwards. He didn't stay to fight us. He ran and there was another uh, bag of explosives further down. They was probably waiting, but since we, came, we went back, he, he just ran. So um, either there was no shrapnel in there, or it was under the water on the side of the little canal enough where, like, the shrapnel came up and he had hit the wall, like hit the wall and exploded up, or something. Because he shouldn't be, you know, he shouldn't have been alive. And um, so we patted him down, and I remember he finally was able to kind of gain some sense, and he goes, "What just happened?" And the engineer leans over and he goes, we just got blown the F up. And everyone started laughing. Because we were safe and I just, the stress relief, um, but I've never laughed so hard in my life. When the, when the uh, medic and uh, another guy from the first platoon came running up shortly after, he thought I was crying because I was laughing so hard. <laughs> and it was just, the, the, you know, just the stress relief was amazing. Um, so we made it, we got them out, we put those guys out on a bird that night because they had concussion and they, they had to go through so many tests. It's kind of like the NFL with their concussions. You had to do these tests. So they couldn't even jump when we got back for a while because they called a traumatic brain injury and they weren't allowed to do anything until they cleared all the tests because um, something could happen in their head. Uh, but, you know, the thing I want to talk about is, um, is, you know, when things go bad, dealing with what ifs, it wasn't the situation. And I feel like I was told by everyone, the engineer before we even got out of there said, you did a great job out there. And um, it wasn't so much that I felt like I didn't do my job, it felt like, why, what if he had died and I was the one that put him up front? And I felt like I should have put myself up front. Even though I had reasoning for everything, I still had a problem dealing with what ifs because I felt like I got away with something, a mistake. and. I mean, it made sense for me to be in the back, but it, it still haunted me for a while. I never told anybody this, but I, for them, from then on, I always tried to put myself up front as much as I could, if it made any sense, um, at least for a little while. Even though, you know, they're a great group of soldiers, and I had, had complete faith in them, I felt like if I want to put someone in this bad situation, maybe I should put myself up in the front. So, let's see if I can kind of frame my thoughts here. Um, you know, sometimes you're just given a bad situation. At, at LT, you know, he handed me a bad situation. And all you can do at that time is kind of take, 
take a second, make sure you're preparing your, your team for the best possible results. And when something goes wrong, you're just gonna have to live with the decisions you made knowing that you did everything you could to make sure that you're looking after them. And this doesn't have to be someone trying to kill you in Iraq. This could be you're in an organization somewhere and you know someone above you is, or maybe the outside organization is giving you a bad situation. You have to make decisions um, that affect the lives of your employees. It's just because if something happens that you can control, it's still gonna, I mean, at least it's gonna haunt me that you're gonna, you're gonna question everything you did along the way. But somehow you have to live with those what ifs and take, you know, just kind of reconciliation or I don't even know how to say it. Take uh, kind of some peace in the fact that you did your, everything you could to set your guys up for success and minimize the, the danger. So. Um, so the reason I want to talk about these situations, these two, is because I feel like, you know, I've got all these other stories. I could tell you, I could talk for hours and times that people try to kill me because it seemed to be a good thing to do for a while. Um, <laughs> but I feel like these type of things where you're placed in a, in a situation that is difficult, that is challenging, that's an obstacle, I think that's where you learn the most from. And I mean, I still feel like the, the lessons I'm learning today help me kind of look back on these type of experiences and learn more from them, even than I had already realized that I had learned from it. It kind of puts everything in perspective. Um, these hard situations are, are kind of what made me grow. I mean, I, the Army gave me a lot. It gave me, um, you know, confidence, uh, you know, a sense of teamwork, uh, leadership abilities, but um, broken knees pretty much. But uh, just like these situations, you can't experience anywhere else, um, at to this degree anyways, but uh, I feel like I came out a better person because of it. I'm better able to look at different uh, events now and, and kind of put everything in a perspective that I haven't been able to put in before. So, you know, my recommendation is when you make mistakes, because I make them all the time, I don't know about you guys, um, I mean, everybody does it. It's, just, it's about how you take it. It's how you overcome it. How you how you learn from it. How you grow from it. And I don't, I don't recommend people go out and try to find mistakes or, or purposely make them, but talk to people about it. I think you can learn more from someone about the, the mistakes they've made and how they reacted to them than you can about their successes. Like I said earlier about my uh, personal voice in my head, uh, Bill Hardiman, um, who I always think of still as a mentor to me, um, that him and his wife were just so amazing people, but he came from a, a place where um, he was in poverty and he struggles with things and he did some time in jail, and now he's, I mean, he's working for Department of Human Services and helping people all over the place. He was a state senator for years and stuff like that. So leaders like that and how they learn from their mistakes and how they apply it to other aspects of their life really kind of changed my outlook on, on what you can do um, from failing. And um, so I guess that's, that's it for that. But. So what's next? Well, I'm struggling with a transition between that and this. But um, I'm happy to work at the Chamber of Commerce where I've got a great people great set of people surrounded me that are mentors, that are professionals, that have helped me kind of transition from that to this, because it is a transition, and leadership style is a little bit different. I don't, I can't just tell someone what to do, and <laughs> they'll do it. Um, but, you know, something else the Army taught me was, you're always training no matter what. It doesn't matter how good you are at something. I mean, up to the highest level person, they're always training, they're always doing something. It doesn't matter how many deployments you've been on, you keep doing the same stuff because you you can always improve. So I'm always trying to improve myself. I'm very competitive. I want to be you know the best person I can be and I'm continually learning. And I think that's why I like to be in groups like this, because you guys all challenge me to think about things in a different way than I have before. And I've already learned some things from a lot of the people in this program and from the mentors and um, like like I keep thinking about what Mark Murray said at the Wheelhouse Talk he he spoke on about about how unique Grand Rapids is, which was immediately noticeable to me, and also how too many people sit around and ask and say, hey, this is a problem, and then don't do anything about it. So we need to be 
be the ones that say, hey, this is a problem. How do we fix it? You know, where do I play a role in this? And um, as part of that, I decided to run, or not run, I decided to submit an application to the Kent County Veterans Affairs Committee, and I got an interview that went very well, so I'm hoping to find out in the next couple weeks whether I got that position. But, you know, as a, obviously being a veteran is very important to me, and I know there's a lot of veterans out there that struggle to understand their benefits and, you know, where they can find help. So I'm kind of hoping that I can get more, more with that. But I'm also looking for other opportunities, and I'm, I'm hoping I can find some ways to partner with people in this organization. But does anybody have any questions about this? I'd be happy to talk about anything. Thank <laughs> you.